Well, Happy New Year. Amen. All right, so where are my astute people in the room that know the pastor's not crazy? And, and why would I be saying Happy New Year right now? Somebody tell me. Bingo! I'm glad somebody... Look, I know more of y'all knew it. He was just the one brave enough to step out on a limb, right? It's the beginning of the liturgical year. Last week was Christ the King Sunday, and, and that marks the end of the liturgical calendar. And then today is the beginning of Advent. The first Sunday in Advent marks the beginning of the liturgical year. Advent, from the Latin word adventus, meaning coming or arrival, we most of us all know is the season, that period where we anticipate the coming or the arrival of, the, of Christ Jesus. Now, certainly, as Ann mentioned when we opened the service, we sit in anticipation and we await the second coming, the second arrival of Christ. But the predominant perspective is preparing to celebrate when God came to us the first time, Emmanuel. Now, I really want us to stop and think for a moment because I, I know what happens is we go through this rhythm every year. We, we read the story. We hear it on Charlie Brown Christmas and, and all of these things. But, but sometimes I think we really need to just stop and, and let it settle within us that God came to us God, in all of His perfect holiness, left His throne and put on flesh to come be with us and to save us. To be Emmanuel, God with us. Let's dive into our scripture this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would come and, and fill this place, fill our hearts. God, give us ears to hear and a heart to understand your message for your people, that Jesus would be glorified. And it's in his mighty name we pray. Amen. You know, as I prayed and studied and contemplated the message this morning, a, a, a thought came to me. And that is, you know, we as humans, we started with Emmanuel, and it really seems like ever since we've been longing to get back to Emmanuel. Now, I know we spent a few months, it seemed like, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 this year. So many of you probably knew exactly where I was going with this by saying we started with Emmanuel. But we know in, in God's perfect design and creation, everything was very good. And Adam and Eve had this relationship with God that was unhindered and not separated by sin. Scripture says God walked with them in the cool of the day. And so that nothing was broken, nothing was separated. They had Emmanuel, God with us. Of course, that didn't last long, and we know hey, they were tempted, they ate, and then the fall, the, the, they sinned, and the relationship was broken. What was unhindered and non-separated is now broken and separated. The walks in the cool of the day were no more. And the more I think about it, I, I, the more I, I really believe that humans have always wanted Emmanuel. 
I mean, just take the, the Israelites in the desert after they've come out of Egypt. M Moses spends 40 days upon the mountain and the people decide, well, that's too long. Uh, who knows? He, he's, he's dead. We don't have a clue what's happened to him. So they just go to Aaron and say, make us gods to worship. We don't know what's happened. Make us gods that will go before us. Well, out comes the golden calf. They wanted that tangible presence of God. They wanted God with us. There are also people who worship creation itself. And we know Paul writes about this some, whether it's the universe, the stars, the, the moon, a tree, a cluster of trees. I, again, people are, in my view, really just searching for tangible things, visible things to be God with us. And, and of course, as, as I'm mulling and chewing on this thought, I kind of began to argue with myself. And I was like, well, okay, well, what, what about atheists who, who just say there, there is no God? Well, how could you say they want God with us? And then I kind of asked myself this question. Can God be more with us if God is us? I mean, let's, let's face it, it. I'm not saying that atheists worship themselves, but if you believe that there is no higher power outside of yourself, then by default, you become the top. You become God. Not in the literal sense. Please don't misconstrue that. The Jews today are still longing for the first coming of the Messiah. And, and I don't know if this is just well-timed or what, but has anybody else been seeing videos popping up on social media about the guy they claim is him right now? And it's a really long name. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. You can Google it. I will tell you it's a harder Google search than I thought it would be, whereas my TikTok for you page, I've seen 50 videos about the guy. But, I mean, you can watch. Crowds are flocking to him. These like big shot rabbis, these well-respected rabbis are, are fighting to get close to him. People are fighting to kiss his hands. And I mean, we want Emmanuel, God with us. Many Christians long for the return, the second coming of Christ the Messiah. I mean, how often do we hear people say and pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus? And I'm just going to be honest with you, something that frustrates me quite a bit is uh, particularly on social media, and maybe it's just the algorithms putting me in a hole, I don't know. But especially lately, I've seen a far more videos about the end times and the second coming of Christ than I have seen videos about doing what Christ said to be doing in the meantime. Now, to be clear, I'm, I'm not faulting anyone for, for wanting or for longing for Emmanuel. God with us is a big deal. Such a big deal, in fact, that after Matthew gets what I call the paperwork out of the way, we get the genealogy, he does a, knocks that out, and then immediately following in this introduction to his gospel, we get this profound proclamation. He says, The Virgin Mary would give birth to a son, and he would be named Joshua. I know we read Jesus, but we also know that when we just straight translate Yehoshua into English, that it's Joshua, a name that literally means the Lord saves. He will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And all of this is to fulfill what God prophesied through Isaiah. Now, there were three things that kind of lifted out and kind of highlighted, if you will, that I want to lift out this morning in the message and dive into these three things as we go and eventually land the plane. And that is the prophecy, because that, that's what we read is the prophecy. Then we're going to talk about the virgin birth, and then we'll close with Emmanuel. So first, the, the prophecy that Matthew quotes and applies to Jesus here comes from Isaiah chapter 7. Now, this is probably the same group of people that knew why I said Happy New Year. But if you're one like me that you love just to dive head first into a rabbit hole that may have no end, but you're going to try to find the end of it, this will be right up your alley. This will really be for you. Because, you know, I've said before many times when I preach that Barnes Notes on the Bible is a commentary that I use weekly. And I went to Isaiah chapter 7, and I want to read you the opening sentence on his commentary of Isaiah chapter 7. Quote, 
probably no portion of the Bible has been regarded as so difficult of interpretation and has given rise to so great a variety of expositions as the prophecy which is commended in this chapter. I'll tell you, that was real encouraging when I went to read that. I was like, well, isn't that convenient since that's the very prophecy that we're reading from and talking about this morning, that, that no portion of the Bible, he says, may be so hard to interpret. And let, let's add just a little bit of context to, to this prophecy in Isaiah. You see, the kingdom of God's people is split. You've got the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern king, kingdom of Judah. And the king in Israel, and the, or the kingdom of Israel, has made an alliance with another king, and they're going to attack Judah. And uh, all, the, all of the people of Judah, including uh, the king Ahaz, they're, they're terrified. Now, look, this is two on one. This is not going to be fair. We're, we're going to be ruined, right? But God sends Isaiah and his son to tell him, hey, don't worry. God's got this. He's not going to let it happen. Judah is not going to be ruined. And, and then through Isaiah, God even tells the king, he says, ask me for a sign. But King Ahaz in this facade of righteousness says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to put God to the test. Of course, it was God who told him to do something, and then he didn't do it. But God says, I, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And then in comes the prophecy in chapter 7, verse 14. He says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now the difficulty in interpretation comes in that we don't really get a clear picture of the fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. At least not that we have figured out. Now if you get to the end of this rabbit hole and figure it out, please let me know, and, and you need to write a commentary because a lot of people would be, really like to know. I, I saw legitimately four or five different feasible theories about how this prophecy would be fulfilled in Isaiah. But, but here's what we need to know. Prophecies often have two types of fulfillment. They have a near or a partial fulfillment, and that would apply to the, the people who originally heard or were given the prophecy. So this prophecy on Isaiah was given to King Ahaz, and so it would have come to fruition in that time. But prophecies often also have a far, or what we call ultimate, fulfillment that would relate directly to Jesus. And that's whether Isaiah knew it or not, does not matter. And, and really, ultimately, how the prophecy was fulfilled in Isaiah doesn't matter either. What matters is that Matthew clearly states in the introduction of his gospel that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, one more little bit of fun that we'll use as we transition into the second thing and talk about the virgin birth. The, the word that Isaiah used uh, is a Hebrew word for virgin, which means alma. But... Here's the thing when you go to Strong's Hebrew coordinates and you start looking at how the word is actually used. That word can mean virgin in the sense that we mean it when we say it, but it can also just mean a young girl. And so really when you look at every time that word is used in the Hebrew, it only means virgin once. In the New American Standard version of the Bible, it is translated as virgin one time. However, the Greek word that Matthew uses for virgin is parthenos, which is translated 14 out of 15 times in the New Testament as virgin. What about the other one? Well, the other one, it's translated as chaste. And so very clearly, this word means the literal definition of what we think it means. It means an actual, literal virgin. Now, the, the question then, okay, Matthew means it to be a literal virgin, but why is that such a big deal? Really, why is that such a big deal that Matthew includes this tidbit in his introduction to his gospel? Two things. One, the sign prophesied in Isaiah was something that only God could know and something that only God could do. Well, the Virgin Mary giving birth to a son, I think would tick, the box to be the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy. But there's another prophecy 
at, at least one other that the virgin birth fulfills. And for this, we go back to the garden when they messed it up. Now we know, like we said, it didn't last long. They sinned. And we get to the portion in chapter 3 where God is handing down the judgment. And we get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And God says, I will put in enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So at some point down the line, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. Now here's why this is important. Because Jesus cannot be the offspring of the woman if he is born of man, of Adam. When the set time had fully come, God sent forth his son born of a what? Woman. When the set time had fully come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Because this was a virgin birth conceived by the Holy Spirit, we have two major effects happening here. First is that Jesus was not born with the same sin nature that you and I are born with. Second is that he is God. Born of a woman, so we're fully man, but the only begotten son who, as John said in the opening of his gospel, is himself God. That's why Jesus was born under the law, but could fulfill the law. That's why his name was to be Jesus, or as we know, Joshua, which means the Lord saves. That's why the angel was able to come to Joseph and say, he will save his people from their sins. And that's why we can say, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to tell you, is that not a hopeful message? That Emmanuel came to do what we as sinners are helpless to do. And that is save ourselves from our sin. Yeah, we're helpless, but we're not hopeless. Because Emmanuel, God with us, came to save his people from his sins, from their sins. Now we noted that Matthew opened his gospel with this profound statement and this fulfilled prophecy of Emmanuel. But, anybody want to quote the very last sentence of the gospel of Matthew? It's participatory. If you know it, say it. The youth are a little bit more trained for me to actually ask some questions. But, you know. It's the end of the Great Commission, and he quotes Jesus. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. We even see this theme in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 18, verse 20. Because Jesus says, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. We do not worship a God who is far off. If, if we actually believe what we claim to believe, then we believe that Jesus is here right now. Emmanuel, God with us. Again, not a God who's far off, but the one true God who promised, I am always with you. But he didn't mean that in a metaphorical sense. See, if you are in Christ, then Christ is not just with you, but he is in you. This is how I explain Holy Spirit when I'm teaching confirmation. Yes, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, but then we have Holy Spirit. We get a step further. We have God in us. Paul says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in us. When Jesus was resurrected and he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, John chapter 20 says he showed up and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, that indwelling presence of Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you have received that same gift, that same indwelling presence of Emmanuel. God with us is now God in us. And then here's the application part. And it, it, it's really very simple. If you fall into that category, then there is a helpless world that is longing for you to be the vessel that carries the message of hope of the gospel of Christ. You see, we know that we are helpless to save ourselves from our sin. There's nothing we can do. But we also know we're not hopeless because we know the one, Emmanuel, God with us, who left his throne and put on flesh to come save his people from their sin. 
See, the world is helpless. We know that. Maybe they know that. But do they know that they don't have to be hopeless? See, this is why I love Advent. This is why I love and, and, and really why hope is the first candle. Because it is the gospel of hope that says, yes, while you are helpless, you don't have to be hopeless because, hey, I know the one that not only can open the pickle jar because we saw that illustration get blown up right in the middle, but I know the one that can save you from your sin. The question is, do we believe it? You see, if we believe it, then how can we not be the vessel that carries that gospel of hope out into a helpless world? I always think about funerals. One of my biggest fears as a pastor is preaching a funeral, whether, you know, we, we don't know whether or not the person knew Jesus. You know, I've heard Rick Burgess joke before. He says, I just look at the music director and say, hey, add some more songs. One of the things that I go to a funeral and I listen for is how long does it take before Jesus is mentioned? Because let's face it, a funeral for somebody who knew Jesus is much, much different than somebody who did not know Jesus. Because at that point, not only are you helpless if you've not repented of your sins and know Jesus, but you're, you're now actually hopeless. So I just say, I don't want... I really don't look forward to preaching a funeral of somebody that we don't know for sure if they knew Jesus or not. Now, I mean, I I would preach the gospel for sure. But again, when you look at the family, it's much, much different. Because I know that my loved ones that have passed away, I'll see them again. Because I know that they, hey, they were helpless, but they weren't hopeless. And they came to know the one, Emmanuel, who came to be God with us to save us from our sins, to be born under the law, to fulfill the law, to redeem those under the law that were powerless, that were helpless to keep it themselves. Church, we are blessed in that we hold the privilege of being a vessel to carry the gospel of hope out into a helpless world. As we walk through this Advent season, as we begin this journey, that would be my prayer. You know our theme for next year is focus. It, we're, we're, we're kind of starting here in Advent. We're, we're getting four Sundays to lead up to the new year. But all of next year, we're going to take 52 weeks to walk through the Gospels. We're going to take a magnifying glass to the, to the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Here at Gunnersville First in 2023, our sole focus is going to be Jesus. And, and not just preparing for a second coming but doing what he said to be doing in the meantime, which is to carry the gospel of hope to a helpless world. Amen? Now, question. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Then let us stand and sing together our praises to Emmanuel, the one who put on flesh and came to be God with us. Amen.